Today's video is going to be in response to a few comments I've gotten off of some of my J antenna videos. Namely, how in the world do these antennas work when the center conductor of the coax is shorted right to the shield? Let's see if we can shed some light on that. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is in response to a few comments I received on my G antenna builds where somebody looked at this little arrangement and said, how does that even work? I mean, the center conductor is connected right to the shield. This should not work, right? And if I pull out my vintage Radio Shack meter, I can indeed verify that if we check resistance, it will show very nearly zero ohms. So I'll cut right to the chase. The reason this is happening is because there is a big difference between resistance and impedance. Resistance is an aspect of DC voltage, but impedance is an aspect of AC voltage. And when we're dealing with RF, RF is truly an AC voltage. So. Let's go ahead and look at this out of a nano. So you can definitely see that this does become an antenna at, in this case, 644 megahertz. So it does indeed work. And the question is, how does it work? So in order to understand how this is working, we're going to have to talk a little bit about quarter wavelength stubs and how they apply to antennas in the, in the building of antennas. But before we even do that, we're going to have to talk about AC a little bit. So the thing about an AC waveform that we have to understand is phase shifts. In order to understand, in order to understand phase shift, we need to kind of break down what's going on in a sine wave. So you have a typical sine wave. It looks something like this. So an alternating current waveform, sine wave. And what we need to understand is, as far as antenna building is concerned, we're mostly concerned with quarter wavelength slices of that waveform. So from here to here in a sine wave is what we call 90 degrees. And then from here to here is another 90 degrees. And we can keep going. We can come down here. Here's another 90 degrees. And then when we get back where we started, we have another 90 degrees. And if you add all this up, we're at 360 degrees. And why is that important? Well, whenever you go 360 degrees in just about anything, you end up back where you started. So indeed, if we were to continue this waveform on, it would just repeat itself. So that's important for antenna building for a lot of reasons. But the main reason is, the main reason is when we build a, let's say we build a quarter wave vertical antenna. Let's make it a ground plane. Something like that. And when we run our transmission line to it, the transmission line is going to come up and the shield is going to attach to the radials and our mast, and then the center conductor is going to come up and attach to that vertical quarter wave like piece of wire or aluminum tubing or what have you. And things in radio happen in, in quarter wavelength intervals. And if you look at this, you're going to see a current sine wave that's been chopped up into four pieces, and it looks like this. So this is 90 degrees. And something interesting happens in a 90-degree selection 
or slice of a sine wave, and that is at the bottom where the current is highest, we have zero volts. And then at the top of this antenna where the current is the least, we have the highest voltage that we're going to see in this sine waveform, whatever it may be. That depends on the wattage output of the radio. But that's also a resonant quarter wavelength antenna, and it will always be this way. And the opposite is true of current. So at the base of the antenna, we're going to have high current. And at the top of the antenna, we're going to have low current. And this quarter wavelength of wire is going to be resonant at a specific frequency only, or odd multiples of that frequency. For instance, if you cut an antenna to be resonant on 2 meters, or 150-ish megahertz, it's also going to be resonant on 70 centimeters, which is the third harmonic of that frequency. The only thing that would happen is instead of having a quarter wavelength, we would have three quarters of a wavelength. Like that. So a quarter wavelength is a resonant structure in radio. Now let's section out our antenna. We're just going to look at the bottom part of this antenna. So just just from here down. What that looks like is that. This is what we call a quarter wavelength stub. The stubs are always made of transmission line. It can be twin lead, two wires in parallel, which is a transmission line. It can be coax. As long as the wires in parallel, it becomes a transmission line of a set impedance. In this case, it's unknown, but it doesn't matter. So quarter wavelength stubs, this one just happens to be shorted, resonate at a specific frequency. Let's say that we designed this to be resonant at 150 megahertz. So this would be just like our quarter wavelength vertical antenna. It would have high current at the bottom, and then it would taper off, and you would have no current on the tip of this thing. And down here we would have zero volts and up here we would have our highest voltage that we would ever see out of this particular combination of transmitter and antenna or transmitter and stub. So the resistance of this, or impedance I should say, follows the voltage output. So if we have zero volts down here, it's also going to be zero ohms. I think this short. And up here at the tip of this, in theory it should be infinity, but it's not going to be infinity, but it's going to be high impedance. So therefore, by moving this feed point up and down, we can change the impedance of the antenna. When we're using a stub in this manner, it's we're using it as an impedance transformer. It's essentially what we're doing. So we'll typically come up here somewhere about right there, and it will pick a point on this stub or impedance transformer that's very close to 50 ohms. Now, that still doesn't explain how it's not a, a direct short circuit when the center conductor and shield are attached to the same copper wire. So let's take the example of a shorted stub. of a set frequency, whatever the quarter wavelength ends up being, that's where this thing is resonant. And we feed RF into it from this point. So let's say that we have a transmission line. We're going to attach it. We have a transmitter, we have a load, and we're going to put a shorted stub. What ends up happening is we've shorted this end of the stud. So we've set that at zero volts can't be anything other than zero volts because it's shorted. When the RF travels down this stub, to get from here to here it takes 90 degrees of waveform. And when it reaches the end of this, this short becomes 180 degrees of phase transformation. And then on the way back, we have another 90 degrees.
and that adds up to 360 degrees. We're essentially back where we started. So these waveforms, the waveform going to the load and the waveform going into the shorted stub will overlap and look like this. And then our stub waveform essentially follows it. So nothing happens. As long as you're transmitting on the frequency that this stub is tuned to, there's no change in the output. However, if you, let's say we double the frequency of the transmitter. Now this stub will no longer resonate and it will actually be a short circuit and it will block any RF from getting to our load. If it's an exact double of the frequency that we tuned the stub to. However, if we f transmit a frequency that's three times as great, then everything triples. So instead of having a 90 degree sh shift here, we're going to have a 270 degree shift. Over here, we'll still have our 180 degree phase change. Up here, it's going to be 270 degrees. And if you add all that up, 720 degrees. And 720 degrees just happens to be 360 times 2. So we went back to where we started twice. Once again, waveforms overlap, no cancellation. Now what happens if we open this stub up? Well then, with the stub open, all of a sudden this becomes high voltage. And this ends up being our short over here. And the way that it happens is we still have 90 degrees coming out of the transmitter through a quarter wavelength, 90 degree shift in waveform. But here, because there's nothing at the end of it, there's no termination, it gets reflected straight back. No phase shift. So 90 degrees over, 90 degrees back, we've changed our waveform 180 degrees. And a 180 degree shift would end up looking like this. Our reflected wave cancels our source. So this would be a dead short at the transmitter if we did this. No RF would pass an open stub if the transmitter was transmitting on the frequency that the stub was tuned to. So stubs can be used as filters. Okay, here's another example of a shorted stub. Okay, in this case, this stub is not hooked to anything. This is a true stub. We haven't turned it into a impedance transformer yet because there's nothing hooked to the end of it. So this one's resonant at 562 megahertz, and you can see the resistance goes up. So we're at 460-ish ohms, right at 562 megahertz. So that's where this particular stub is resonant. And in order to turn it into an impedance transformer, all we have to do is to give it something to drive. And now all of a sudden we have an antenna at 580 megahertz. This thing would radiate RF just fine. So now it's an impedance transformer. Without this connected, it would prevent a very, very high impedance to the transmitter. Everything that was being transmitted into this antenna would get reflected back to the transmitter or very nearly everything. If we drive it with an antenna, now it's an impedance transformer. Most of that energy is being sent through to the antenna and the antenna will radiate at 580 megahertz. So that's the short it's done. Now you can do this with an open stub. So in this case, we have an open stub. 
Okay, this one is an open stub, and you can see it's it's essentially the same thing. Because in this case, the lowest resistance point on the antenna is where the coax attaches. So it's still a perfectly viable stub, even though there's no direct connection. Which begs the question, could you make a J antenna without the J and just directly drive off of this open stub a radiator, and would it work? And the answer is, yes, it would. So it is possible to make a J, well, it is possible to make an antenna off an open stub as well. It's still acting as an impedance transformer. It's just we don't have that short. Now, why don't we do it that way? And the answer to that is there's some good reasons to have the antenna short at the ground, both the center element or center conductor of the coax and the shield shorted to ground. And the main reason is for lightning protection. So if we have a shorted stub and lightning somehow strikes the tip of this antenna, instead of going down the center conductor of this coax to your transmitter and blowing your transmitter up, it's going to short straight to ground because lightning is DC. So lightning is DC. Will that rule out the risk of any damage of your trans transmitter? Probably not. Still, uh, the simple fact that there's so much voltage can over override your transmitter and cause damage. But it's definitely better than not having anything at all. This is essentially the way some lightning arresters are made, is by providing a direct DC short to ground. The other possible benefit of having your radiating element shorted directly to DC ground is in some situations when the wind blows and it's very dry out, you can get static electricity buildup on antennas. And this can be noticed if you if you hear random popping surging noises in your transmitter. That's basically high voltage on your antenna that's jumping to ground somewhere. We don't know where that would be, but if you ever hear a random pop or a snap in your transmitter, that's probably static electricity bleeding off the ground somewhere. So with a direct DC short like this, that would be an impossibility. You, don't, you would not have to worry about that. So there's, there's definite design benefits by having an antenna that's directly shorted to ground. And if you look at my four element Yagi, 10 meter Yagi that's up in the air right now, it's got something on it uh, that high gain calls a beta match, but it's essentially a hairpin match. And on that antenna, if we were to look at that in detail, what you would see is you would have the boom of the beam, and then you would have a reflector, and two directors, and then you have a driven element, and with a hairpin match, the driven element does not connect to the boom. It's insulated from the boom. And you think, well, okay, so it's not shorted directly to DC ground, but that's not the case because the hairpin comes off of the ends and directly shorts to the boom of the antenna. So these elements are both shorted directly to ground. And essentially, the hairpin works in creating a what we call a shortened stub. So that right there is part of a shortened stub, and so is that. And those will be resonant at a certain frequency, and they, they provide inductance in the antenna. And the way that these antennas are set up is you have to make the driven elements slightly shorter, which makes them capacitive. And then we add inductance back in, series inductance with the hairpin. And it gives you a short to DC ground, and it also gets you 50 ohms. Because if you didn't have this, if this were directly connected to the coax, this would actually be somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 ohms, which was too low. We want 50 ohms. So the hairpin match allows us to get to 50 ohms and provides a direct DC short to ground. So there you have it. I hope that's helpful. It helps explain how you can have a direct DC short to ground, but with AC, that becomes an impedance that the transmitter will like. Thanks for watching.